a young age, I have been in love with science. As my parents often recall, I've always asked questions about everything, and I mean everything. How do plants grow? Why are bridges shaped like that? What's in the shot that the doctor just gave me? Can animals talk to each other? And the questions went on and on. Thankfully, my parents encouraged that questioning, and I channeled my energy into after-school projects and elementary school science fairs. But then came a moment that changed my life forever. I was 15 years old and on a trip to India with my family. And I'll never forget seeing this long line of people outside of a tiny clinic waiting to get treatment for mosquito-transmitted diseases. And as I came home, I couldn't forget those people. I couldn't forget the look of suffering in their eyes. And I knew I had to do something to help them. And that was when my journey truly began. Now, as I came home and began doing some research, I was surprised to find that over 250 million people worldwide are affected by malaria alone. And these people are more concentrated in developing countries. And so a question popped into my mind. Why is there such a high prevalence of mosquito-transmitted diseases in developing countries? And oftentimes, the answer is that people there can't afford traditional mosquito repellents. And so my solution? invent an all-natural and inexpensive mosquito repellent that will be accessible to the global population. But as a high school sophomore, I had this big idea, but very few resources. And most people I told my idea to thought I was crazy or way too ambitious. Thankfully, however, my science research teacher and my parents believed in my goal. They believed in this idea. And that was when the fun and the hard work began. Now, in many ways, I was like a startup, working in my garage and in a high school classroom. And I started out with trips to the local hardware store to buy all the equipment, to build the, to build the different things that I was going to use in my experiment. And the first thing I wanted to find out was why certain people are more attractive to mosquitoes than others. Because I'm someone who, when I go outside, I come back covered in mosquito bites. Yet I have friends who can be in the same place at the same time, and they don't get bit at all. And I always used to wonder, is there something in our perspiration that makes us more attractive? And through my attractive to mosquitoes, <laughs> and, <laughs> and through my experiments, what I found is that people who have higher levels of nitrogen-based compounds in their perspiration are more attractive to mosquitoes than those who have lower levels. So I thought, what if I can make an all-natural repellent that will neutralize these attractive components? then they'll no longer be attractive, and the mosquitoes won't be attracted to us anymore. So I started playing around with fruit juices and plant extracts and different oils. And after what I can definitely say is a notebook full of failed recipes, I finally landed upon one that shows great promise. Not only is it really effective, but it's also all natural, so that it won't lead to environmental harm or to bodily harm. And it's inexpensive, so that it will be accessible to that global population. So where am I today? Well, I'm currently in the process of looking for investors to patent my repellent and bring it to the next level um, and market it. And on the other hand, I've also been conducting research here at Stony Brook University for the past three years, looking to improve the diagnosis of cervical cancer. I also just completed a 10-week fellowship at the Jackson Laboratories, further investigating cancer and tumor formation. But standing here today, I feel so fortunate to have this opportunity to share my story with you all. But I can't imagine how different my life would be if I didn't have mentors along the way to motivate me and to support me to get to this point in my life. Because my idea would have just stayed an idea. I'm grateful that the first time I told my science research teacher that I wanted to create this all-natural mosquito repellent, that she didn't say no, she didn't discourage me. Instead, she asked me, Are you, do you really want to do this? Are you willing to put in the work? And when my answer was yes, she said, OK, we're going to go on this journey together. And that was something that's so special to me, to have someone who is supportive, but who didn't just show me the answers, who challenged me to look for them myself, to find these resources and to utilize them in new ways. That is really what makes mentorship so important. 
Now for me, science has always been the solution to all of my problems. And I guess it's a, it's a result of growing up in a household with both of my parents being engineers. Because any household problem we encountered was solved through innovation. And I remember, instead of going to the supermarket with, to buy chemical cleaners, my mom and I would spend time in the kitchen putting together our own all-natural household cleaners. And that's something that I love so much about science, is that you can start with a problem or a question that you have. And through failures and through mistakes and through a brainstorming process, and it, you, can find, you can come up with a tangible product. In my case, it was an all-natural mosquito repellent. But it's a tangible product that has the ability to create real change in our community and in our world. And it's in those failures, I think, that I've learned the most um, while I was creating this mosquito repellent. Learning to persist through them, um, learning to use these failures to motivate me. And it's difficult to do that oftentimes when you're on your own, unless you have a mentor there who believes in you and who continues to encourage you through those failures. But besides just that, besides the support aspect of mentorship, mentorship is really important because it can show people and it can show our society that science is open to all people, regardless of age, regardless of gender, regardless of race. And I think even though science and the, the people who do science have changed a lot over the decades, society's perception of them has almost stayed exactly the same. So let's try a little example to show this. I'm going to say a sentence, and I'd like for you all to picture this sentence as best as possible. There once was a scientist who synthesized a new chemical compound to treat tuberculosis patients. Who did you picture? A male, maybe in a white lab coat, sitting next to a microscope, or with a beaker full of solution? And if you did, don't worry, because I did too the first time. And that scared me. I'm a woman in the field of science with mentors who are women, yet I still have this image of what science, of what a scientist is. And there was recently a study done at the Fermi Lab, and what they did was they took in a class of seventh grade students, and they asked them to draw a picture of who they think a scientist is. And as you can see behind me, who they drew were men in white lab coats, um, one of them holding a beaker with solutions, because this is who we think scientists are. And then they brought these people into a lab environment. They let them spend the day talking to scientists and seeing what science actually is. And then they brought them back and they said, OK, now draw a picture of who you think a scientist is. And what they saw was something, what they drew was something far different. They drew men and women wearing colorful clothing. Um, they saw that scientists are real people. And I think that little example of bringing these, these seventh grade students into a classroom and allowing them to see what science is, we can translate that into our society in general. If people have the ability to see that science isn't something that's polarized, but it in fact is linked to all facets of our life, and that bringing innovation to life involves not just science, but it involves businessmen, it involves lawyers, it involves designers, and that science is a cohesive and important part of our society. If we can make these bridges through, by making science accessible to people, we'll create a better society. And so we need to break these stereotypes, because science, the broad subject that it is, it's not, it's multidisciplinary, it's exciting, um, and it's passionate, and we need to bridge these gaps so that people can see that. And so today, I'd like to propose a challenge to you all. Imagine how different our world would be if each student who had an idea like the one I did was given the resources to pursue that idea. Not only would we have more innovation in our society, but we'd also create a generation of students who are committed to the scientific process, committed to putting in the work, um, a generation of thinkers and change makers and so my challenge to you all is to mentor one child. Inspire him or her to see science not just as what's taught in the textbook, but as the world around us. Challenge him or her to use science to create change. Because through this mentorship, we can start to foster this love for the essence of what science is, which will then lead to innovation and ultimately tangible changes that can make our society and our world a better place. Thank you.